Today the insolvency wave has yet to hit, but Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Well, Equifax data suggests that while the overall rate of insolvencies in March 2022 was up 5% on last year, construction insolvencies were 28% higher. Iconic firm Grocon collapsed in 2020, and this year mega builder ProBuild with its $5 billion pipeline of work, fell over. And since then, ABD Group, Pivotum Home, Condev, and most recently Next, went under. And in the first quarter of the year, compared to the same period in 2021, 270 construction companies filed for insolvency. That's a 21% jump. Building costs have risen so much that one construction professional says he goes to work every day knowing he'll disappoint at least one person. Stretched global supply chains have fed into soaring costs of materials and ongoing border closures boosted a hot labour market, meaning tradespeople have been charging more. So it's created a profitless boom, with many construction companies committed to projects that are no longer financially viable thanks to major price increases for building materials. Now the managing director of the collapsed Gold Coast building firm Pivotal has warned other big builders face insolvency with skyrocketing costs of construction and price gouging compounding an industry-wide problem. Pivotal, which has built more than 1,500 homes across 15 years, was placed into liquidation on Thursday following other major firms such as Condev and ProBuild earlier this year. Managing Director Michael Irvin said the combination of floods, building material price hikes, high demand for labour and Covid disruptions gave him no other choice. This is a bigger picture, he says. It's right across the industry with price increases, with trades increases and with shortage materials. There are other builders, big builders out there at the moment that are in the same position that we were. Pivotal, which employs 16 people, has 103 houses under construction, with work yet to begin on 177 more. One customer, who signed a build contract with Pivotal in May 2021, was hoping to begin construction in December, when the land settlement was finalised, but construction never began. And three weeks ago, he signed off a $12,000 build variation on the site's slab. Then on Monday, I received a call from them saying, we're going to send you through another variation, and that was for $93,000. Their excuse was that the construction costs had gone up so much that they weren't able to eat the costs anymore. Unsure now of what to do, but likely to lose the $5,000 deposit is probably the only way forward. There's no point. I bought it 12 months ago with a contract that said they were going to build for this much money, he said. I've taken out my mortgage with the intent of that, with a little bit of variation, obviously, because things happen in builds, but I'm not going to be able to go back to the bank and say, hey, I need another $100,000. So for that particular person, the dream of earning his first home has been delayed, and instead he'll sell the land and find a new rental property. For me to be able to build the same house now would cost $100,000 more, he said. Now, in a statement to spokesperson from the Queensland Building and Construction Commission, the QBCC, said insolvencies can be difficult times for all involved, especially homeowners with incomplete projects. Homeowners with unfinished homes impacted by the collapse of Pivotal will need to lodge a claim with the QBCC. And the QBCC recommends homeowners seek legal advice about terminating contracts because an invalid termination will mean the homeowner is not entitled to a claim. Now, Mr Irving said pandemic measures 
such as the Home Builder Scheme, fueled high demand within the construction industry. But because homes were built on fixed price contracts, firms such as Pivotal have been forced to absorb the rising costs of material and labour. We used to see price increases once a year in January, said. There's a price increase of 5% and that was guaranteed for a year, whereas now they put it up 5% a month. Mr Irving said that the pay rate for bricklayers had jumped by 100% over the past 12 months, while the cost of carpentry has increased by 44%. That adds thousands of dollars to the cost of a house, and with a fixed price contract, the two ends weren't going to meet, he said. Rather than keep trying to wing it and go forward, I had to make the really hard decision. But Mr Irving said some tradespeople had been gouging the prices and putting them up beyond what was necessary. Because there's such a shortage of trades out there, it comes back to demand, and they can demand what prices they want if you want your houses finished on time, he said. We supply everything, they just turn up on site. Mr Irving said Pivotal staff would have their entitlements paid out, that his suppliers had been paid, and that any other outstanding debt would be resolved over the next week or so. Derek Cronin of Cronin Miller Litigation, which is acting on behalf of Pivotal, said he has seen an increase in inquiries from the building sector. The company will have significant credit, as he said. The company needs to go into liquidation because it will become insolvent in the near future. Mr Irving said this week was the turning point. Do I take the responsible position yesterday and put the company into liquidation knowing my staff would be paid in full, knowing all the accounts were up to date, he said, or do I keep going on and wing it, which you can't do but other builders probably are? And more broadly, a range of actions were taken through COVID to protect businesses, including safe harbour insolvency laws written to protect companies unable to predict future turnover. But of course, that's now all unravelling. The ATO, for example, stopped pursuing debts as the pandemic unfolded. Tens of billions of dollars in stimulus were pumped into the economy. And as a result, businesses stopped going broke. And even as the economy recovers to this new kind of normal, the number of businesses going into administration each year is thousands below pre-pandemic levels. There are definitely businesses that in ordinary times would have gone under that were able to continue trading, Scott Mason of credit reporting agency Equifax says. However, the drought of insolvencies doesn't mean that companies are necessarily doing better. Instead, there are distressed companies still operating that should have been killed off long ago taking people's money even as they circle the drain. And Scott Mason says that's a big problem for their customers and suppliers. The real issue is you don't, as a normal consumer, know who those companies are. So I think there is some danger for people who enter into business with them. And as well as the supply chain, supply and labour constraints and rising prices, we can expect to see a significant rise in firms folding because the Australian Taxation Office has now resumed chasing small business debts as the COVID holiday ends. As the ABC reported recently, public and media pressure stopped the tax office going harder in pursuing debts owed by small businesses struggling through the COVID pandemic. Previously, secret internal documents revealed. It comes ahead of an expected rising wave of companies going under as the ATO chases debts that's not pursued since early 2020. The reports, obtained using the Freedom of Information process, reveals a softer approach of sending text messages, sending blue rather than firmer orange letters, and a move away from stronger action in favour of help and assistance for small businesses. As the ATO lauds its new approach to small business debt in October 2021, in a report headed Context, it urged staff to understand why. The ATO is aware that the small business market has been one of the most affected groups during COVID-19 and the associated lockdowns, media and community sentiment have reflected on both the support for and fragility of this market segment and the ATO has been proud of its role supporting small businesses through the stimulus measures, the document said. During COVID-19 and the associated lockdowns, we moved our focus away from stronger and firmer action in favour of help and assistance and enhanced engagement work with clients to resolve or manage their debt. The scale of the problem is massive 
As at August the 31st, 2021, the tax office had issued 842,845 reminder letters, with around 55% of them going to small businesses. When the ABC contacted the ATO, it had sent out letters warning about outstanding debts to 29,552 businesses and a further 52,319 letters warning about the potential for director penalty notices, the DPNs, were sent to people in charge of those companies. These programmes are focused on those who have not responded to our calls and letters and have significant tax obligations outstanding, an ATO spokesperson said. In the FOI documents, leaders told staff, we also note that there is a significant concern in the community that many businesses were completely reliant on the stimulus measures during COVID and as they are removed and reduced, these businesses may not be able to overcome the trading disruption of the pandemic and be unviable. A threat to DOP companies with tax debts to credit reporting agencies, which could cause the company's client to stop doing business with them, has worked. The purpose of the disclosure is to support other businesses to make informed decisions about who they are doing business with. The outcome we are seeking is behavioural change and engagement rather than actual disclosure, the document reads, outlining the gambit. The programme has been very successful. We commenced in August this year and as of the 30th September have issued 70 notices of intention to disclose to clients. As a result of the engagement, we've made no disclosures and 69 clients have re-engaged with us and managing total debt worth $6.5 million. But a softer approach is notable, particularly after ABC reports that exposed brutal treatment of taxpayers in disputes with the ATO. And in the previous history documents, the tax office outlines its new pandemic-inspired approach through COVID, the ATO paused its firmer and stronger actions instead, looking to re-engage with help and assistance while businesses manage the effects of the lockdown, it reads. The number of early interventions, the blue letters, have continued to increase from previous years as we continue to engage with small businesses throughout the bushfires and COVID-19, offering help and assistance. Over this same period, however, the number of letters with a firmer tone, the orange letters, were was reduced instead reverting to lighter touch blue letters. And interestingly, of the 18 pages released to the ABC in the Freedom of Information request, eight were fully blanked out and ten were partially redacted. And so, as the ABC went on to report, Australian Securities and Investments Commission data reveals that in the two and a quarter years since the pandemic began in Australia, just 10,000 530 businesses have entered administration. That's fewer than went under in the separate financial years of 2008, 2011 or 2012. And the 10-year average for companies going into administration is around 9,300 a year. I think over the coming months, we will start to see many movements in insolvency, said Robin Erskine, partner of insolvency firm Brooke Baird. And I think it's going to be upwards she says law changes, programs like JobKeeper and the ATO giving companies a reprieve from paying tax debts change the usual cycle of businesses that would seize around 10,000 go under normally each year. That means a likely increase in companies going into insolvency, Ms. Erskine said. I think that those businesses that haven't been able to pay their debt, and we know that there's a lot of the unpaid taxes, there was a lot going into COVID, those businesses now are going to be asked to pay. In the ATO's 2021 annual report, total debt was around $58.8 billion, and just 65% of that, $38.5 billion, was collectible, meaning likely to be paid. Most of that owed achievable debt is owned by small and medium enterprises. However, the amnesty is now over. The tax office wants its money. Tax Commissioner Chris Jordan told senators in February that the ATO was taking a measured approach. We are concerned that the longer businesses stay out of engagement with us, the more problematic the collection of those debts is, he told the Senate. It's something we cannot just ignore because the debt stock has gone up about 14% from the same time last year and is now around $40 billion. We have to focus in as empathetic as we can, but it is something we just have to get on with. Scott Mason is a general manager of commercial and property services at Equifax, one of the companies that would have been dobbed to had the ATO's gambit been unsuccessful. He sees dangers ahead as companies that should have gone under a long time ago are forced 
to wind up. A lot of those companies continue to survive where, ordinarily, they may well have gone under, he says. In the past two years, there's been a lot of discussion of so-called zombie businesses artificially propped up by the JobKeeper wage subsidy, low interest rates and the tax debt moratorium. Now rates are rising and those supports are gone, so the pressure is on. And Mr Mason says small operators are dipping into their personal finances, a sign of growing stress. Looking at sole traders, small proprietors, sort of those smaller end-of-town operators, they are twice as likely to have their personal mortgages in arrears as the general population. So clearly, there are some pressures down at that end of the market. It's created a profitless boom, with many construction companies committed to projects that are no longer financially viable, thanks to major price increases for building materials, Mr Mason said. The issue with construction is that intense competition meant some companies won contracts that left them with only thin profit margins. With skyrocketing costs and being unable to recoup them, they're losing money on the deals. Fixed pricing is a real problem for the sector. In other industries, when their costs rise or fall, they can change their pricing. You can see evidence of that, for example, in the supermarket. When you buy fruit and vegetables, the prices are changing based on their costs. But the construction industry can't do that. The danger for consumers and people working in construction is that it's often hard to tell if a company is in trouble until it's too late. It's difficult to see from the outside. A lot of those businesses will look like they're operating normally, they'll be paying their wages, they'll be keeping the lights on, but their balance sheets and their financial position might be very stressed. Research from Creditor Watch suggests the hospitality and the entertainment industries are currently the sectors with companies at the greatest risk of default ahead of even construction. And there has been a rise in the business of invoice financing. An invoice financing company buys an outstanding debt and pays the firm, let's say, 90% of it in cash immediately, expecting to eventually receive the invoice's value, so they profit from the 10% or so left over. It's very common in the US and the UK, and it's a long-standing way for companies to improve their cash flow that helps to get money coming in more quickly to balance payments going out. But it's not without controversy. Most recently, the focus was on the collapse of globe-trotting firm Greensill Capital. The increasing popularity of this type of business goes some way to explain why the victims of corporate collapse in the field of construction are often small to medium-sized subcontracting companies, subbies, that are not household names. Most contractors, whether they are plumbers, chippies, whatever they might generally be, have two or three months of their own expenses into a job before they put in their progress claim. So they're always running about two to three months of expenses and bills and subcontractors, wages, etc. And they have to fund that before the debtor, whoever that may be, that they're going to work with actually pays them. The model means the subbies are outlaying money, services, staff and supplies and relying on companies to pay them months after the costs have been sunk. If in the month of May they put their progress claim in, then it will get paid in, say, mid-July. So typically, there's two to three months of a subby's work in a job before they receive the payment for it. This means a host of small companies can spend a lot of money before the music stops and things fall apart. Equifax's Scott Mason is confident about what will unfold as the tax office restarts its normal business collection revenue owed to it. What you will see is, on the good side, you've still got a lot of availability of funds and people are still trying to lend. We've got a lot of good consumer confidence still in the business confidences in the market, he says. But it's in everyone's interests that viable businesses are supported and they have an even playing ground that they're not competing against businesses who are not paying their taxes and not paying their employees for our country to move forward and prosper, which is what we all want. But there are real-life consequences for customers. So, for example, one reached out to me just the other day saying, I'm part of a group of 20 purchasers of a two-bedroom home in an estate in Victoria. Those homes are on a small 200 square meter block. The land at the time of purchase was $90,000 and the price to build $125,000. So they're going to be sold for about $265,000. The purchaser was eligible for a $20,000 regional first home owner grant and also the $25,000 home builder grant. And the builder was chosen by the estate. But two days ago, that same builder informed the estate that they could no longer build the properties and the estate has presented the purchaser here with three options. One, sell the land back to the estate 
and it probably means they wouldn't be able to get a new grant as they're technically now property owners or they could sell the land on the open market through their estate agent which is just valid for a number of days or build the property with their new builder who's now charging $294,000 to build and that also means losing the home builder grant as it would be a new contract and also more than likely surpass the 18-month time frame to build. So the point I want to make here is that we are now looking at the very sticky end of the construction sector. And it's very important that people who have contracts with builders really check them out. And if you're walking into this situation now, make sure that you know a lot about your builder. Are you using a builder that is going to survive? Because you cannot rely at the moment on the insolvency processes necessarily taking the bad ones out of the picture. And therefore, people could well be losing their shirt ahead. And more broadly, the whole point of this story is that we're going to see a significant rise in defaults and failures, particularly among small business owners. And many of those small business owners will have a mortgage, and that could put pressure on their mortgages, of course, and therefore they could default, and that could put pressure on the banks. So I think we are walking into a very significant period of higher levels of defaults as the supports are taken away, just at the time when interest rates are rising and when pressures due to high inflation and other factors too are all bearing down. This is an opera which has not yet got to when the fat lady is going to sing, but I reckon she's about to take her first breath. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.